the more that we actually learn about the world we're in, the greater the mysteries. One in 50 American adults had experiences that could point to abduction. It's extremely brave for someone to make their story public in this arena. We'd look away and the ship would light up and the next thing is just boom, it's gone. Men and women have been taken for purposes of reproduction and hybridization. I was abducted. I wake up and there's such a bright light. They would tell me to look in their eyes. They're controlling your thoughts. Inserting this gigantic tube inside of my body, it's painful. I'm now looking who this man is. He is inside of me. It's a screen image of the reptilian. They began the insemination process. A new embryo is created and that little hybridized embryo already formed is implanted in the womb and she will gestate. They always want the children fetuses. I would go in for my appointment and there would just be no baby. With a very long needle through the belly button, we go into the uterus and they would find the fetus. It holds on to the fetus and pulls out. And then they bring this little girl in the room. And he said that she's yours. This beautiful eyes, this face, and I see myself in the child. She was emanating her feelings. I was shocked. It was nobody's right to impregnate me and use me as a laboratory rat. I went from 210 pounds to 115 pounds. These beings that are doing the abducting don't have the same morality as we do. They don't think what they're doing is wrong. Hearing other people's accounts will make you go, OK, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Who are we serving? We need to ask those questions. Look, human beings take in animals in the wild and bred them. Can we be bred into something different? The answer is absolutely, of course we can. Educate yourself. Be open-minded. Don't be dismissive. People have been taken. You can't ignore this anymore. Make up your own mind. Don't let anyone ever tell you how to think. Sorry, guys, not all DTs are good. Hi guys, and welcome to another edition of The Kevin Moore Show, which is sponsored by Channeling.com. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, John Sumpel. Now, John is a founding partner of J3 Films, as well as an award-winning producer and director of Extraordinary, the Stan Romanek story, and Extraordinary, the seeding, which is the second in a trilogy of films intended to take viewers deeper into the abduction and hybridization phenomena. So without further ado, John Sumpel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to having the conversation. Well, we've just played the trailer at the beginning of the show here right now, so folks have just got a, a bit of an understanding what this documentary is about. Um, so many questions for you, so many questions. J to begin with, though, I want to know what sort of piqued your curiosity to sort of want to do this documentary, because I, I, I know from my own experience, obviously, you've got to be so immersed in it, you know, you can't let it go, basically. Sure. It started actually when uh, we were working on uh, the first film, the, the Stan Romanek documentary, which was uh, came out in uh, re originally released in 2014 and then re-released uh, three years later by The Orchard in uh, April of 2017, then on Netflix in July of 2017. So when it really was a matter of the response that we got to that film. So the response to that film... We, we had an outpouring of uh, direct messages on Facebook and uh, emails of people saying, you know, basically thanking us. 
and it, very emotional responses to how the film made them feel like they were validated, that they were uh, not alone, that they weren't crazy for the experiences that they were having. So it, it made us kind of think, wow, this is um, this is an emotional thing. This is trauma. This is uh, something that we're not really paying too close attention to because we're really zeroed in on the phenomena. We're more concerned about the lights in the sky uh, and, and trace evidence and, you know, photographs and, and video. That's what people are honed in on. But very rarely is there any attention spent on the the experiencer themselves and, and what what the experience of having an abduction or being through something so unbelievable to somebody who's never had it happen, what that means to them. So that really was kind of a catalyst in uh, saying, let's let's see where we can take the emotional side of this. But we also had been introduced to the idea of unexplained pregnancies back in 2012. And we always thought that was a good idea. And we didn't do a lot of research in it until we were presented with the opportunity to make a second film. The Orchard said the first one did well. Are you guys interested in doing another one? My initial reaction was, geez, I don't know if I want to be pigeonholed in this genre. Uh, but once I made the connection to the emotional thing, I realized that this was more about humanity, the human condition. And it was about the plight of the individuals going through this versus just solely about phenomena. And it wasn't until we spent the time on the phones doing the interviews to vet the people that we use in the film. And then obviously sitting in front of, uh, you know, the different people that we interviewed for, you know, the, the, the nine, uh, experiences that we interviewed, we probably interviewed easily for 30, 40 hours. And then that's just of what we captured. Uh, and then on top of that, you have, you know, the the time that you spent with them. So when you're looking in their eyes and you're having a uh, a visceral moment of uh, them being vulnerable and trusting you with their story to the point where they can break down, be as 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 raw as they can be, you realize that there's a lot more to this story than the abduction itself. It is the response that you have as an individual who's going through it. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, um, how long does this take to actually film and uh, edit together? Well, it actually happened pretty quickly. We uh, had a meeting with The Orchard in, um, let's see, where's it, 19? Yeah, so it was November of 2017. And uh, they were interested in our ideas for what we would do following up on, on the first film. We pitched the idea of doing a trilogy of not necessarily uh, each is a standalone, but when you put them all together, they take you deeper into awareness of what the abduction phenomenon. So it takes you basically from the lights in the sky that started in Stan, the Stan Romanek story through the abduction process in, in this story and the, the emotional impact. And then the third film is going to be about, what's what is the end game what where is this going right right absolutely and uh, you know one thing you sort of um touched on there was obviously you didn't see yourself being pigeonholed into this field right, right? so what was your right. background and did you have an interest in any of this subject prior to that first documentary yeah, Jack and I talk about this a lot, and there's there's a good yin yang there with us because he has been passionate about paranormal and ufology from a very young age, and uh, this is something that he had done research for. Uh, we got involved in doing a project together back in 1995 based on some photographs that he had taken at the Myrtles Plantation in uh, uh, St. Francisville, Louisiana, just north of uh, Baton Rouge, and they were profound images that uh, kind of put him on that path. And then when he started going on that path, he kind of pulled me into it. We had just become friends within months of that, that experience happening. And we came up with a concept for a TV show, uh, that was a little bit before its time. We, it was basically a reality show where we followed around, uh, paranormal investigators who brought along with them Paris or, um, psychic mediums for the, you know, the whole idea of capturing that channeling moment when, uh, when something, and we had great footage and, and it was a great proof of concept, 10 minute trailer. 
and it went nowhere. Nobody was interested in, you know, six years later, uh, most haunted burst onto the scene and changed everything. So was, we basically were six years ahead. Our concept is almost exactly like most haunted's was almost to the, to a T. So that, that was, uh, when we first started and then we didn't do anything from the late nineties. Jack continued in paranormal investigations and did a lot of that. He wrote a, a couple books and he also did tours and all of that stuff. But then we started talking in 2009 about doing kind of a road trip documentary on crash sites and phenomena in the Southwest. And uh, why, right when we were in the process of developing, developing that, Jack went to a, a Richard or a Stephen Greer uh, presentation and met Alejandro Rojas and Chuck Zukowski and was introduced to the Stan Romanek story. And he called me up and said, I think we have something that we should explore. And that kind of got us going. But I had been involved in uh, digital or visual storytelling for a long time. I'd started dabbling in independent projects back in the late 80s and had been involved in some corporate videos for several years. So it wasn't something that was completely foreign to me. It, this was the opportunity to do something that I'd wanted to do for a long time. So it kind of kicked everything into high gear for us. Absolutely. Now, your website is for this documentary? J so there's the j3films.com website is for the production company and specific to the film, uh, extraordinary, the seating.com has information about the film and, uh, just all the background information about who's in it and okay, so the synopsis I'll, and all that stuff. We'll, absolutely. So we'll put those links in the, the uh, description of this video. And if people okay. want to purchase that, then they can either purchase it online through the link. Uh, and eventually obviously, you know, if Netflix takes it, then obviously that's where they'll find that documentary. Sure. And that's one thing I want to clarify, too, is everybody's like, well, is it going to be on Netflix? And that's something that we don't control. The distributor controls when they decide to pitch it to the content platforms. And usually they wait until there's traction on it from digital sales. So uh, none of the content providers are going to uh, sign an exclusive a licensing agreement if they don't have a track record. So uh, we hope it lands on one of those, but there's no guarantees. Uh, Netflix isn't really buying a lot of independent content. And when they do, it's much lower than it used to be. Uh, so, you know, the way that, you know, unfortunately there is a money component to this. Uh, we need to pay our bills one, but the, the distributor wants to make sure that they're, they're getting the biggest bang for the buck. So they dictate a lot of the promotional things that we do. And also, uh, you know, what happens in the licensing agreements, we're really completely out of the picture on that. It's out of our control, but, uh, you know, fingers crossed that it'll get to a larger, uh, audience down the road because ultimately we want as many people as possible to see the film. Absolutely. You do. And there's so many different ways now digitally to distribute documentaries and, and movers of this sort. If anyone's watching this and they're thinking, you know, they've got an idea, there is just, uh, uh, yeah, and especially in this genre nowadays, it's just kind of taken mm -hmm. off a bit, which is surprising. It it's surprising. It is a little bit. I think that uh, uh, there, there's, you know, you go back 10 years, uh, ufology was still kind of considered taboo and still considered fringy and still considered only happened to people who were, you know, from the backwaters. It wasn't, uh, you know, your everyday people. But uh, most of the people that we talked to, there's, there, were, there were no fringy people. There were no, you know, there's the, the, the stereotypical hillbilly type that gets, you know, abducted and dropped off on a dirt road and tells the story and everybody is like, well, you know, he's got his tinfoil hat on. We didn't encounter any of that. And a lot of the people that we spoke to when we were vetting them for this film, they were, uh, there was a lot of people disqualified themselves as much as they wanted to tell their story. They felt like, well, there's, I have too much to risk. I have a career to risk. I have uh, family relationships to risk. I have a, a, a marriage and children. One woman that we spoke to said, I so badly want to share my story because of the things that have happened to me, I think will help other, other people. She said, but if I tell you this story and I go on the record, I will likely lose my children. So she's, she's, she's like, you know, my husband has made it very clear to me that uh, this is something that will be uh, damaging to all of us, to the family unit, if this becomes something that you choose to do publicly. And she's, she said, I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. But um, there was fortunately people that were willing to come forward with their story because that I think having people share their stories makes other people feel more comfortable about uh, telling their stories because when they find out how 
you know, bizarre and strange they are compared to what we, you know, those of us who have not had experiences, at least that we're aware of, we can't, we can't compartmentalize those things because they just don't seem normal. So with more and more people sharing them, more and more opportunities for conversations to percolate up and, and potentially become part of the, 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 the lunchroom conversations, the dinner table conversations and, and more awareness. And that's ultimately what, what we're hoping will happen. Yeah. I mean, it must've been sort of transformational for you to have, uh, you know, seen through these interviews and how excited you must have been to want to, you know, to have to share this information because, uh, I'm guessing that, that uh, you know, it, it, it changed you in a way when, when you actually, uh, oh, absolutely. you know, took part in this. Yeah, it was, um, so, you know, we screened about 30 people, 30, 35 people, uh, two, three hour phone calls, more than one with some people, uh, to really try to better understand, you know, what, what their, the essence of their story is. And to qualify if they would look good, uh, you know, on camera, they were uh, eloquent in how they delivered their story, that they would be confident if they were sitting in front of a camera and a crew and lights and, you know, people to sit down and tell their story. That was one of the questions we asked. That was, you know, are you going to be okay with that? Are you going to be okay with, one, sitting in front of everybody telling your story, and two, having that story shared with the world? Is, is, are you okay with that? Some people disqualified themselves because it was too nerve wracking. But once you, you spend all that time with these individuals and you hear their stories, that's one thing. And then you sit down in a room with them where you're five feet away and you're looking them in the eyes as they start to get deeper and deeper and deeper into their story. And, you know, uh, I, I, I pride myself on giving them the space to share their stories and just ask leading questions to take them a little bit deeper. And we uncovered amazing things as a result of that. And I felt that the the story solidified for me throughout the interview process. And when Melinda Leslie, we interviewed her and she talked about, you know, really drove home with an emotional plea that this is important that we take people who've been through this type of trauma seriously, that we treat them with the same respect that we would treat someone else who has gone through something challenging and traumatic in their life. We're there for people who have a loss uh, of a parent a loved one, a child. We're there for people who go through uh, diseases. We're there for people who are who are depressed and 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 down. We're there for people who go through divorces, and breakups that are you know challenging. We're there for them. But with something like this, most people have a tendency to turn away. They they're like this is a little t bit too too taboo, and th that really made drove this story home to me that this is m more about humanity and less about the phenomena. The phenomena is the, the big picture, sure, but I think the message that I wanted to make sure we drove home in this film is that, uh, you know, three things. One is that we want to create awareness. We we target our films to reach the widest audience possible. So that's a major concern for us in, in the storytelling so that we're not just appealing to people who already believe. It's very important. So that's one. The second one is that we wanted to create a, a story that would encourage people and show people how important it is to be compassionate and empathetic. And the third thing that we really wanted to accomplish is to, for people who've been through trauma who haven't shared it, to realize that there is a community out there for you, that it, it, it is healthy to t talk about your story with people who can relate to you. Because one of the things that people that is very difficult when you go through something like this is that when you finally build up the courage to go and share with somebody what happened to you, if their response is negative, you go through that process of doubt and pain and anguish all over again. So that things like that, we just, I didn't think about that until I sat across from these people and I saw that challenge in their face, their eyes, their, their emotion is that, you know, I, I don't know what's going on, but it's so hard. It's hard for me to, to, to function. It's hard for me to wake up some days and really move through the day. And when you hear that over and over again, and you see that you spend the time with the people, uh, you really have a better appreciation for the, the trauma, the traumatic experiences that they go through. So obviously I've seen the screener and, um, you know, it was really well put together. Um, 
it was just easy to watch, you know, and it, and it was captivating as well. You know, I mean, obviously, I have a, I have a, I have a fairly busy day, and and and, I, and and you know, it's nice to watch something that actually draws your attention and shows the subject from a, a different perspective, a very grounded perspective. But that's what I got from it, and uh, I'm I'm really glad with the people that you put into that documentary because they came across really, really well with some amazing stories that they shared. Right. So so if you were to sum up the documentary, how would you sum it up? Just very briefly. Briefly. of the hybridization program. So, you know, abductions to hybridization programs to children, we take people on a journey of that. And then we move into the emotional impact and why it's important for us to uh, care and be empathetic and compassionate. And then uh, the sense of community and how important it is for people who've had experiences to speak about them and to share them. One, because it helps other people better understand that this is happening to more people than they thought. And uh, it corroborates a lot of existing stories that are out there. And two, it makes the people who've gone through them feel like they're not alone. They're not encumbered with something that is so distracting and traumatic and disturbing if they're sharing it with other people who can console them and share with them. This is how I, I managed, you know, with, with dealing with this. So that maybe not the reader's digest version, but that's a quick synopsis. No, absolutely. No, thank you for that. Thank you. And I mean, when you look at this phenomena, at the end of, you know, putting the documentary together and obviously, you know, it's about to be released now and everything else. I mean, what is your take on the phenomena? What do you really think is going on? I mean, can you even give a definitive answer of what these people have been through? Well, that, that's one of the things that I, 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 I have no problem saying is that I don't know. I am not sure. I think that there are a lot of... Uh, variations on what the potential end game is. And that's something that we, we go into in the third film. We specifically, there is a third film that we're in post-production on now, which we hope will come out around the same time a year from now. So that we'll kind of continue a little bit deeper into the story. And we explore three paradigms in that one, the, the biblical paradigm, the ascension paradigm, and the colonization paradigm. Three very, very different uh, belief systems, but all of them are, are based in the idea that aliens exist, they're abducting people, they're conducting experiments on hybridization, and there are hybrid children. But the end games are very, very different. One is, you know, Jesus is returning, the other one is ascension to a higher vibration, and the third one is they're here to take over. Three very different outcomes. But uh, so, you know, that's, that's where I, I'm like, I don't, there, there is no definitive proof that I've seen that says that there is one thing happening or another. But there seems to be one thing clear is that there is sexual reproduction experiments going on and hybrid children are an outcome. Why? I don't know. There are a lot of people who are, are probably the deeply involved in one specific storyline that could serve that question much better than me. But, you know, my take on this is that I think it's important to tell stories to people in the center of the bell curve who may have never heard them before and let them do the deeper dives, let them have more of a, uh, a self exploration as opposed to us trying to tell them what they should believe. Cause we're really not doing that. We're presenting information and letting people draw their own conclusions based on what they see. I mean, what, is the spiritual aspect of this work as well, of this documentary. I mean, obviously, there was so much material you would have had for this documentary that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure there's lots would have been left out. Sure. Yeah, we had an entire, we had three interviews that aren't even in the film. <laughs> Four, actually, um, because uh, we thought they would be better served for the next one. And that's the religious, spiritual side of this. And, you know, when I look at this, and, and this is something that, you know, we've talked about at length uh, for years as a result of being involved in this, is that at the end of the day, the real big question that, that we need to ask is, you know, what's the end game? What happens to us? Why are we here? Where do we go when we die? What are these, these big existential questions. And we, we keep going back to this something that, you know, again, this is metaphysical. This is not just about UFOs is if there is disclosure tomorrow and it's about technology and it's about intelligence and beings controlling that technology, 
there is a house of cards that collapse with the paradigm that we've been led to believe for so long. You know, the first question is, well, how long have you known about this? And it's been, if it's been for a long time, how come we didn't know about it? There's been lies and deceit that's happened for years. So that's one big thing. Do you trust in the institutions that you've hold, held sacred or believed in and confident that they were protecting you? Uh, then there's the whole paradigm of, well, what is a multiverse and what is multiple, multiple dimension existence? And are we galactic brethren with other races and how do we integrate? Those are things that you just, you know, when people are like, oh, I want disclosure, but <laughs> be careful of what you ask for. Yes, absolutely. I mean, for these scenarios to really be taking place and in these people's world, it is their truth. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and and for for you know, um, a fetus, well, a, a baby is to be take to be removed, you know, like they have been overnight, right? And, mm -hmm. and it, it's almost like you know the the women are back to normal health wise in the morning, minus the 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 fetus or the or the, or, or an right. actual, an, the actual baby, if it was, you know, depending on what stage it's along. That's a technology that's so far beyond our understanding. It's almost sure. like it's from another dimension or universe. Yeah, and it's something in, you know, when you start having that, uh, the, the more of the exis existential discussions is, well, we can't, we can only process it based on what we know. And I think there's more about what we don't know that would explain a lot of this, you know. And there's a there's a theme in the film uh, that uh, anybody, when you watch it, you'll be aware of it. And it's, uh, we, we talk about Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, uh, Circles essay, which the concept there is that whenever a circle of knowledge and awareness expands, you might have a greater understanding of something, but it only presents more questions. So as, as you expand thought and awareness and belief and truth, there is more questions to be asked to take you even further. So there is no end to that expansion of this, the, the, the belief of technology, the belief of, from philosophical perspectives, from uh, phys physics. The laws of physics are what we know today, but they're going to change. There are other alternative beliefs in physics that are not at the forefront yet, and they're kind of in the fringes, but they're, they're proving to be something that we should be taking a look at. And we will have some huge advance in, in physics probably within within our lifetime that will change everything that we know today. And is it is it a matter of different dimensional beings? We're 3D beings and maybe there's we'll we'll understand what the fourth or fifth or sixth or tenth or whatever, however far you can go with it. So those are the things that I like to think about beyond just what uh, you know what is what is the end game for an alien. You know, it's it's about what happens to humanity once that truth is is present absolutely and what were some of the most profound um stories that you came across then that really was that you know aha moment or the, even that like oh my god um you know an emotional moment as well because you mentioned that it was a very emotional journey for a lot of these sure. people sure well the the one that kind of stands out in the story that most people who've seen it just kind of you know ask us about is uh sierra neblina is lifelong lesbian has never been with a man before and and she said she was pregnant and she was in a relationship with a woman when at the time and she explains her whole story in the film and she said i was pregnant i was showing i was three months long and i had never had any physical contact with a male before yet her girlfriend was questioning it based on the scenario that they they had gone through so that was one that's kind of a little bit of a head scratcher and then you know three months all of a sudden it's gone and that's one of the things i think that's important and any woman that's listening to this or watching this they they know their bodies you can't have somebody tell you like oh you know you go to a doctor and you're like something happened that i can't comprehend it's different but a doctor will say well your body absorbed it these things happen they look for ways to try to explain it away because they don't have answers and they don't want to say to you like well I, I don't know what to say it might be aliens they're never going to say that you're never going to hear a doctor say that they're going to try to 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 kind of nip it in the bud and move on as quickly as possible and that sometimes leaves women confused so i i i, I don't like that part of it so that that's that's one of the things that we heard over and over from the different women is that the doctors will kind of put it in, in a corner. And we tried to reach out to several doctors to see if anybody would go on the record. We came close to having one almost go on the record, but ultimately decided uh, that uh, he didn't want to 
participate. And uh, he was very close. I mean, we conversations that we had uh, in, you know, people believe it or not, but he said that I, I can honestly say that I have uh, met with women who've had these experiences. I have had cases where these women lost, lost their, their babies. And uh, he said, I, I, I can't tell you that they were taken by aliens, but I can also say that it, the body didn't just absorb it. Something was different. Something was, I can't quite explain it. And not to say he, he, he wouldn't have gone on the record and said, it's aliens. He would have said that there's something, there's anomalies here that just don't seem normal. So, but that's one thing. But the other big thing, you know, when you ask the question of, you know, what was profound, uh, the big other big thing was talking to a couple of the different women who said um, that this was not just, uh, you know, an experiment where they extracted ovum. There was two stories that we heard, or two women in particular, with multiple stories about physically being raped by a being. And when somebody starts to share that story, you know, with you and you're not expecting it, it, it it's a two by four to the head. And I was stunned when uh, April first shared that and she used the word rape. And in the film, I, I left, you know, this question in there because it was a, a, a stunning to me in the moment that it happened. And I, in the film, you can hear me say, okay, hold on a second. Uh, you mentioned the word rape. Cause I was just trying to make sure that I clearly understood what she was saying. And she goes, oh yeah, it was rape. So, you know, and having those conversations, you know, when the camera is off too, to get more details and, you know, there's only certain things that they're going to be able to, to be comfortable with sharing, but the, yeah, it's crushing when you hear somebody say that I have memories of a being being on me of, of their face next to mine, of these, these scaly hands on my body. That's whoa you know, you, you're hearing that and you're seeing how they're expressing it and the emotion that goes into that. And it's, it's powerful and it's shocking. And it's, I think, worthy of bringing to people's attention because at the end of the day, the question that we ask in, in, as we approach our filmmaking is what if this is true? What if it's true? What does it mean? Should we, you know, if, if we have multiple women saying that this is something that happened to them, should we discount it? And I, I, this is another thing that I, I, I bring up quite a bit, too, is that we interviewed Dr. David Jacobs for the third film. And I was talking with him about the whole idea of, you know, there's a lot of people that need empirical evidence. And he got very angry and he said, you know, I'm sick and tired of people telling me that we need empirical evidence. We have years of evidence, which is storytelling. The, the, the testimony of the people who have had these experiences that corroborate each other's stories over and over again. He said, he's pointing up to, he says, I've got 3,000 regression tapes upstairs in my office that uh, are, are enough evidence for me to say that I'm pretty confident that I know what's going on. So that's one of the things that I think, you know, it would be nice if we could, you know, truly embrace storytelling and experience as part of the uh, the, the cumulative evidence that is happening in the world today. Well, obviously you've spoken there about, you know, and I've asked you the question, you know, you know, who and how did you choose the subjects that were in the documentary or film? But then how did you apply that as well to the people from the, in the UFO field? How did you choose the, the ones that you thought were the right ones that you felt were credible as well? Well, the credibility was a big part of it and definitely have to sh thank a few people, you know, for both both sides of the equation, both the experiencers and the uh, the experts. And uh, we leaned heavily on Chase Klotsky and Lori Wagner and Lori connected us with Yvonne Smith. And we had conversations and through those connections uh, and, and having conversations about who are the best people, both from an experiencer side that you know of. And one of the things that we said is that, you know, there are people who have been telling their story for years. We don't want those. We want something that's new, something that people, when they see it, they're going to like, I've never heard of this before. And, and, you know, this story is unique or this person seems like somebody that I, I, I would work with or could be a brother or a sister or, a, a, you know, a coworker or a family member, or, you know, somebody that looks like your next door neighbor. So that that was important that we, we that we captured that. But with the experts, we wanted... We wanted to, you know, so we have two people in particular, Richard Dolan and, and uh, Mark D'Antonio, who are uh, practical and uh, their their belief is that they're not going to go, you know, all in on something that that is 
say as far fetched as as this as missing pregnancies, but both of them said that when there's enough corroboration, and uh, you hear the same things over and over, you have to start to listen. You have to take it seriously enough. Uh, you know, if there's a handful here and there, you can say that they're anomalies, that they're outliers. But when you have so many of these, and I think after this film comes out, there's going to be so many more who are willing to step forward and, and share their stories. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, you know, I guess I asked that question as well. It's just, you know, one thing I've learned in this industry is discernment recently. Mm -hmm. And and that's, yeah. you know, that's an ongoing um, teaching. <laughs> and it's, a, sure. you know, a, it's, it's not an easy one. But as this field expands, there are more and more uncredible people that come along, but that's fine. That's sure. with any field. But that, I think that's what I liked about your documentary is it, 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 it brought through credibility and discernment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you, when you hear people like Alejandro Rojas and Richard Dolan and Mark D'Antonio talking about things that uh, they really don't have a space in their head for it because it's, it's a tough one. But yet they talk about it in a way that, you know, we need to pay attention to these stories. We need to uh, not push them into the shadows. We need to listen to the people. And for the very, you know, they all agree that, you know, even if I may not be, you know, firmly standing with both feet in the camp of the people who've had these experiences, I can't discount that they have had something profound happen to them. And if we can get everybody out there to do that, and, you know, it's un it's unbelievable when you, you, you do different interviews and you see comments that some people make is that they're, they're wrapped in their own little paradigm bubble and they're comfortable there and if there's a challenge to their belief system they'll do anything they can to shut it out and it's usually based on fear and i think a lot of people react the way that they do because they're afraid that you know if this is true everything that i believe in is destroyed and i don't know what that means what do i do if i have to you know live in a different paradigm i have to exist in a different way and you know there, there's a plenty of people who don't believe this and you know what that's completely fine. We're not trying to, you know, bang people over the head and say this is this is the truth. We don't know. But when there's so many people that are having these profound experiences and they're impacted, their lives are transformed as a result of what they go through, I think we need to pay attention to that. But it almost comes to the point as well where, you know, if this is a real phenomenon and it's really happening and, you know, we're talking about the ability to you know, uh, move into a time space where, you know, you're able to extract and do the things that are happening to these women in, in a time frame that's not normal in a, it's almost like they're removed from this time frame and they're going somewhere else. And sure. how thin are these veils if that really is happening? And what are the veils? What is this mm -hmm. reality? What, what, are, are we a soul having a human experience or is it so much greater than that? Yeah. And that's when we get to the existential conversations of, uh, you know, I look at it as that, you know, we're linear thinkers, you know, time marches on. It's a, a beginning, middle and an end. Um, but what if that's not the case? You know, what if we're living in a multiverse and things are happening simultaneously and we're, we have the ability, but we're not tuned into uh, moving back and forth between the two. And maybe we're having multiple existences. You know, the, again, this is just crazy talk, you know, but it it deserves our attention because what if it's true? What if what if that is something that becomes our reality in the next five, 10 years? Or what if there's a truth that can't be found, but at least it opens up Pandora's box a little sure. bit to, yeah, to look. It's that expanding circle. Yes. Sure. The ex and that's, I think, the big part of it is that I think, you know, when people say is disclosure coming, I always say is that, well, it's up to us. You know, the disclosure is going to come from the people who keeps telling their stories and it's going to it's going to push the conversation to the center. And that's more of an internal disclosure for these people, I would have said as well, because when they're going through the hypnosis or regression sessions, you know, um, obviously, are they it, were, were there some that recall a connection with what? Whatever it is that are extracting this, I mean, it, what, was there some sort of connection to that which is doing this to to the the essence of who these people really are as well? Is there some sort yeah. of soul contract or something? Or some of them are, you know, some of them there is, you know, it, 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 they might not know it. So people are like, well, everybody who's gone through this has has it's a contract. They made an agreement to do this. Uh, usually, though, that you're not sitting in bed going like, well, 
it's time for my contract to kick in. I should be abducted. No one remembers that and recalls that. And if they do, they usually you have these people who, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say that they're hybrids and that they're here for a purpose. And that's to help with the ascension of, of, of humanity when the time comes and the time is, is near. So, you know, do we discount those people who feel that they're, they're important because their, their contracts are for them to do this work? I just point to probably the, the most compelling story that we have in, in the film, which is Geraldine Orozco. Geraldine had a, uh, an abduction experience in 2013 that rocked her co to the core. She was completely shaken by it. She didn't know if she could even process it in her mind, let alone tell her immediate family or extended family. And shortly after that abduction experience, about three months, she started dating somebody and eventually told him what happened. And his response was, well, this is something that, you know, you have to kind of bury. You have to kind of keep it, push it aside. And uh, she agreed initially. And uh, she had some things happen to her. She was activated as a result of this abduction, this consciousness that she had with this abduction, that over the course of four years, she eventually got to the point where she's like, I, I need to know what happened. I need to know more about this. And she had a regression in 2017, early 2017. So a little over three years later. And she said that uh, further knowledge, further activation, she comes home, and this I think it was in January, February of 2017, she comes home and breaks off her engagement with her fiance and says, I can't do this. I, I need to follow through on my truth. She goes back for another regression a month later and even more comes through to the point where she said, I need to quit my six-figure a year career and start dedicate my life to helping other people who've been going through things, similar things. She's, and not only was it a matter of uh, feeling compelled to do it for the, the good, she said, I was shown things. I have seen things. I, my mind has been elevated and my consciousness has been plugged into the big picture to the, to the matrix universe and have a better understanding. So when you have somebody that has that kind of ratcheting up or reconnecting to what she always knew, but had kind of closed it off. But she found out through the regressions that she had been started having abductions when she was five, six years old and, and, and throughout her, her childhood. So it, it's when you have somebody who goes through, who, who train changes their life. And I find it difficult when I hear people say, well, she's crazy. Like, no, she's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. <laughs> she's yeah. not crazy. Yeah. And ag again, in the movie as well, there were both male and female um, participants. And for the male um, people as well, I mean, were their experiences just as uh, valid in a sense? Were they just as hor horrific uh, recalls? Yeah, with uh, we, we talked to a couple of people that uh, opted out, eventually opted out, but had fascinating stories. And, and all of them are, you know, sperm extraction, uh, multiple times they're abducted and having that happen, and eventually seeing hybrid children. This is something, whether you're male or female, that you eventually are shown these children. So that's trauma, when you feel like there's a connection to who you are, uh, and that you're not allowed to see them, be with them. You're, there's this curiosity of, I wonder if they're okay, how they're doing. Once you've been shown that, once you're told, once you're getting a telepathic message that this is yours, hold it, hug it, show it some affection, because they want to have that kind of uh, imprint put on the child when it's young, that, 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 that have that kind of motherly love and affection that apparently they're not able to do. This is not my area of expertise. I'm more of the storyteller, so I, I don't want to, you know, go off and make it sound like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to all the details there. But um, when you hear those stories about, you know, men and women seeing children and then having that sense of I have a child out there that I, 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 I what does that mean? What does that mean? How many do I have? And, and like that. But Rob uh, Fullington's story is a little bit different, too. And his is... Uh, one of the reasons why we included him is because it's not just about reproduction as we know it, you know, egg and sperm and DNA, you know, 
mixed together to form something. His was about shared consciousness. And he said that in his abduction experiences, he felt that, uh, you know, what he was witnessing was that he, he could see his body on one side of the room, but his consciousness was on the other side. So his consciousness was being removed and, and, and used uh, in a different capacity. And he said there was one time, one time in the film he mentions where his, he woke up and his consciousness was inside the body of a, of a gray. And he looked down and could see his hands and he said, these are not my hands. And he freaked out. So, you know, he's, he's saying that there's a shared consciousness program. So we have, uh, sexual reproduction as one way of replication, but we also have consciousness, shared consciousness is another way of replicating. And there are people who tell stories about these clones and how they're using consciousness to drive these clones. And that's a whole nother story. So one of the, you know, we, we don't go deep into that cause we just, you know, it's just not enough time, but we wanted to make sure that people understood that there are different agendas and different programs and different experiences. And, um, you know, I mean, what if he was picking up on a future life, past life, or simultaneous, sure. simultaneous life recall, and, and mm -hmm. that's, that's what, what it maybe could have been. Uh, I mean, the idea of shifting your consciousness to somewhere else, or that there was a sort of shared, there was a program taking place where it was, you know, you're moving consciousness across. I mean, that's just I mean, we, we just can't even, we, we barely can get out through the understanding that we're, you know, more than our body, you know, that the, mm -hmm. the, the, the I am mm -hmm. exists, sure. you know, and then you to talk about, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, that, that's, um, that's, that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough and, one. And for his, his story to me has been the one that has been most interesting to follow even after. So we, we filmed this last, uh, a little over a year ago. And, uh, you know, to see Rob's journey over the course of the last year, he's learned more. He's gone through a lot over the course of the last year, and it hasn't all been easy. There's a lot of struggle, you know, and his his biggest thing is that I'm I don't know if I'm comfortable being earthbound. I just, uh, I, I know too much. He's, his thing that he has shared with us is that I've been shared so much of what's out there and what's going to happen next that it's just, I, it just doesn't feel right to have all this knowledge and be aware of these things and be present in this paradigm, in this earthbound paradigm. I can't relate to that, but I see what he's going through and I see the anguish and, you know, he's not schizophrenic. He struggles with it. You know, his whole thing, too, is like, you know, I would have never raised my hand for this. This is not something that I uh, that I wanted. But he says he has a feeling that his consciousness, he relates more to the consciousness of what you would call the mantids than he does to his own earthbound consciousness and what he knows as being a human. I mean, these stories that you've shared with me so far are just absolutely, you know, fascinating. And, um, you know, I, I think... <sighs> I think we're, we're we're all looking, aren't we, to try to find the answer to this in this field, and I, I think it's so much more than just sure. the UFO field. I think it's beyond that, uh, person. Yeah, personally, oh, I and I think that's what agree. your documentary does is to show grounded people, like I said before, with uh, extraordinary, as I'll use your words there, uh, stories. And um, you've done an amazing job putting this together, uh, as you have, and um, you know. Uh, I think this this sets a bit of an ex a standard as well to what can be you know produced and, and put out there. I will say that. Um, obviously, with these abductees as well, most people in my field as well, th there has been that theme that actually the abductions have stopped. But in this documentary, watching it, it has not. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. No, no, there, the Geraldine still right, has exactly, things happening to her exactly. to this day. And um, you, did any of them walk away with with gifts that they never had after the abductions as well? Did they? Were, I mean, I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, but with the gen, gentleman that you mm -hmm. sure Geraldine for sure. You know, she now you know her touching into the uh, electromagnetic field into a, a bigger consciousness it's it, it, like she like she'll tell you it's like i was activated i was shown um or I was reconnected to what I've always known. She thinks about it in a very different way. So she's somebody who's gone through things that are horrific, 
she'll tell you that they were horrific, that they, she still is frightened by some of the things that happened, but she's gone to a place where she processes it and has tries to share a more metaphysical approach to all of this and you know that we're trapped inside of a matrix universe that we have manifested and we allow to continue on and until we m remove ourselves from that through we will always be stuck in this and i remember the first day that we we sat and talked with her it was a lot of you know jaws dropped deer in the headlight stares because it was so intellectual and there was so much of her interview where like if if we if we shared just this interview we would be appealing to a very small group of people because it was so it was so beyond what we um comprehend i mean i had a little i mean we all had a little bit of a difficult time at certain points with what she was sharing is to say wow this is so hard to wrap your head around and it's so hard that we it would be very difficult to share this with the population and have them embrace it in a way that they were like yeah yeah it was it, very very challenging and in when you hear her talk she talks about it so eloquently and so knowledge you know from a point of view. yeah knowledge. well you know i've interviewed a lot of people on the near death a lot of people on death a lot of mediums a lot, a lot of channelers a lot of people right and i'm like well hang on a minute what what if it's just a mass psychosis that we go through the tunnel that we have a life review that we right. you know choose to come back which you know and all, and all this what 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 if actually it's so much bigger than that and that's that's not what it is. Right. It's, it's beyond that. I mean, we'll never know. I mean, my whole point mm -hmm. for doing a, a show like this with people like yourselves is to show what can any teaching information from that space be put into our present moment? Can we get something from sure. that? Sure. And it's one of the things that we really, you know, we feel like um, we have a responsibility to uh share entertaining stories because entertaining stories are engaging. So that's important, but to share stories in a way that there, you mentioned the word discernment earlier, that there, that you're using some discernment, that you're not just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. And maybe some people like, and some people won't, you know, our, you know, we use this, uh, mantra of trying to reach the widest audience possible and in order to do that you have to give them information that isn't too far to one extreme or where they'll they'll be challenged to say i this is i don't know what to do with this and i'll tell a story and i've, I've told this story numerous times if anybody has seen uh, us in any of our other presentations about this you've heard this before but when we screened the uh, Stan Romanek story in November of 2013. It was down in Fort Lauderdale at the Fort Lauderdale International Film Festival. Uh, I used to live in Fort Lauderdale for years. Jack lived down there for a while, and Jamie had family. So we had connections to that area. So we had a full house. We had 150 people that showed up for the screening. And it, they were most of them were there to support us. They weren't there because of the subject matter. But... You know, the, the the two comments that I heard afterwards was, wow, that was really good. I wasn't expecting it to be that good. And I was like, well, what were you expecting? <laughs> was it, were you expecting something that was, you know, you know, really, you know, poorly done? That was one thing. But the other thing was, uh, you know, this this sense of like, wow, I, I had no idea. I had no idea that people were having this experience. But this one good friend of mine uh a, a few days later, she goes, I wanted to take some time to process this before I talk to you. So she pulled me aside one night and said, I just, you know, it took me two days to really think through this. She said, I have to let you know that I never, this is a very intelligent woman. She said, I never had a place in my head for this before. She said, I, I, I always thought of this as something that you see in the movies, that it was science fiction. I never really thought it was happening to people. And when you present it in a way with someone who came across on camera as being very credible, that his stories and his emo the emotional impact seemed like you could you could be there with this guy, or that he's somebody that you you know you could say that's that, that that's just like the guy that I know that lives down the street. And she said, I I just had no place for this. It's she goes, it's forcing me to kind of really evaluate everything that I had been 
shown and led to believe up until this and she was in her 40s at the time she's like this it's causing me to th rethink a lot of things in my life and she said i just wanted to let you know that it had a profound impact on me not because i was hook line and sinker but i it made me stop and think you know what if this stuff is true and that to me was the i i tell that story over and over again because that is ultimately what we're going for. We're going for people who watch it and, and go like, oh my God, I didn't know about this. I wasn't aware that these things potentially were happening to people. But when you see the visceral, emotional response of, in their storytelling, it makes you pause. It makes yeah, you step Yeah, well, you've back. definitely done that again with this one. So well done. And it's not an easy feat to pull off. And it, you know... Um, yeah, like, you know, kind of the example you're using there, if you could change one person's life, that's the universe within one person, isn't it, in a right. sense? So, you know, that's mm. that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, what would you say then, obviously, because we're getting to the bottom of the, or top of the hour, should I say, what would you say then is the most important message of this documentary and the work that you're doing right now? I, I think... Um and there's a there's a, a a handful of different things, but really when I, I I look at it is that the 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 biggest impact that this film could have, in my opinion, is that one it 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 catches fire, and and people see it and want to share it and they want to have conversations about it. If we can start a international global dialogue. Uh, that uh, where people say this is this is something I never really thought about before. And uh, the thing I'm probably most proud about uh, with the screenings when we've had with people in the theater or with individuals who have screened that is is what we hear over and over again. There's nothing else like this. There's never been a film made like this before from that really takes the side of the experiencer and shows people that that side. So that's where I think there's some tremendous impact is that here's a, here's a film that looks at the other side of the, of the equation where, and, and, you know, it's, we've heard this term over and over again for people, you guys flipped the script. You guys really took this and turned it on its ear because it's always been about the phenomena. That's all we see. We see the phenomena over and over again. You took us behind the curtain and showed us what it was like for an experiencer to go through a very painful and traumatic process. And we witness their ability or inability to come out the other side. You know, you know, April has this curiosity and wonder and almost naivete with it. So she looks at the positives and her son being a byproduct and that's another story but she's okay with it she's okay with what she went through because it helped her deliver her son geraldine is on a mission now to help other people she's reconnected to what she says i've always known to be true i just was asleep and now i'm reawakened and then you have rob who's really struggling he's struggling to find the meaning behind why the experiences happen to him. And, you know, when you see these different journeys, it makes you realize that everybody's truth is different, but yet the pain and anguish that they go through, regardless of what phase they're in, is very similar. And that uh, there's processing that they have to they have to go through. The emotion it's an emotional film. And I think that, you know, I'm not saying this that it's gonna be um Something that's going to, I don't want to turn people away from it. It's like, oh, it's going to be a, you know, a big, you know, emotion fest. And it's not so much about that, but it does, it does take you inside of the lives of the people who've had these experiences. And uh, I'll say that when we've screened this, um, one of the two times that we screened it at, at, at theaters, three times that we screened it at theaters, the, there were people who reacted to it and came up to us afterward and said, this triggered me. This triggered something in me. I am now connecting to some things that I never, that, that were simmering in the background that I gave no consciousness to. And it was, you know, just percolating in my subconscious. And now it's just burst through. Uh, a couple of people who were in tears, you know, at the end of the film, uh, we've had it screened to a couple of uh, people who said, uh, one person that we did an interview with, she said, um, 
I watched the film last night. Uh, we'll get through this interview today. <laughs> I have tons of questions. Uh, I'm excited, but I need to let you know that it triggered things in me that I am very challenged by, that I'm, I'm, I, I need to process them for a while before I can even have a conversation with you about them. So we think that that is going to happen with a lot of people is that they're going to be like, well, I remember when something happened to me. I wonder what that was. I had the same reaction, you know, because that's one of the things that I'm not a woman, but I can honestly say, having spent time with these women, they know their bodies and they know their bodies, you know, inside and out. And when something isn't right, they're aware of it. But yet a doctor makes them feel like, oh, don't worry about it. It's this is normal. And they're like, geez, this isn't normal. <laughs> you know, so no, I Absolutely. And the website, one final time, is? Uh, for the film, it's uh, extraordinarytheseating.com and for the production company, j3films.com. But extraordinarytheseating.com has uh, links to everything that, you know, all of our social media. It has links that you can follow to see the film uh, and uh, the trailers on there as well. Excellent. Well, we've been putting that on the screen, that website on the lower third throughout this interview as well. That was just for the podcast purposes. And of course, the link in the description for this video will send you to the documentary. And John, I just want to say thank you so, so much for your time today, because I know it's late where you are as well. But thank you for coming on to uh, you know discuss this uh, important documentary. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed the, the conversation. It's always fun when uh, people are interested in, in, in the subject matter and you can have meaningful conversations. So hopefully people that are listening will be uh, feel compelled to watch the film and then have the conversations too.